Thank you, Tina. Thank you to the entire Creative Morning community for having us and also allowing us to start at a much later date than usual. <laughs> 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 that would have been hard for us. We're in California where we're social distancing together. Um, Roxanne, there is so much going on in the world. Is there? And I have um, watched how you have risen to the occasion of telling the world what you think about what's going on. But I wanna ask you how you are feeling about what's happening today in the world. Um, that's a good question. You know, I think that every single time there is a, a murder of a black person by police, I hope that this time will be different and that there will be measurable change and action. And there is for a few days or a few weeks and then we get back to normal, which is unacceptable. And I I'm skeptical this time as well, but I will say that this time more people and more white people in particular seem to be paying attention. Like today, this is Juneteenth. And I think for the first time ever, ever many people are discovering Juneteenth. Uh, and so I don't know if I'm encouraged or just sort of bitter because black people have been here all along and have been demanding freedom all along. So uh, I'm, I'm a little skeptical, but I am encouraged by the things that I'm seeing, the sustained protests all around the world, but especially here in the United States. Um, so I'm just trying to, I'm trying not to feel hopeless. Tell us what Juneteenth actually is. We're hearing so many different things about it. Um, and I think our audience would really like to hear from you how you would describe Juneteenth. Well, I'm not an expert on Juneteenth, uh, but Juneteenth uh, was June 19th, 1865. And that's when Black people in Texas found out that they had been free for two years. And every since then it has been a celebration of black freedom and it is actually the oldest holiday celebrating the end of slavery and uh it, it's significant because freedom is great but also it just demonstrates the, the disconnect that that people just didn't bother telling white people, let me be clear, did not bother telling black people for two years. You said two years. I read four years, but I could have read something wrong. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation, I believe, was in 1863. Okay. And so, you know, that's what Juneteenth is. And it, it is celebrated around the United States, but particularly in the South. Now, when you say celebrate, mm -hmm. we're, we're celebrating something that should never have occurred to begin with. It's a, right. it's a really hard way of being able to understand something. And it reminds me quite a bit of the Jewish uh, holiday, so to speak, Yom Kippur, where Jews reflect on their uh, sins and, and try to redeem themselves for the hurt or the um, negative uh, behavior that they've brought into the world in the previous year. So people don't say, have a good Yom Kippur, although people often do because they don't necessarily know what it is. How should we be thinking about how to talk about Juneteenth? Well, you know, it, it, it is a bittersweet thing in that it marks the end of an era. But at the same time, it is a celebration because when you are an enslaved people, that moment where you understand freedom and get to experience is, is a big deal. And that's what people are celebrating. I do think that it should be a national holiday. And uh, there's actually a black woman who has been fighting for, I think, two and a half decades to get it as a national holiday. And she might actually get the chance now. She's in her 90s. Her name is Opal, and I can't remember her last name. And so it, it, it's a day that I think for white people, you should atone <laughs> yeah. and reflect and think about yourselves and not demand black labor on this day or frankly, any other day, but especially on this day. And like, don't go up to your black friends and be like, happy Juneteenth. Like, just go and, you know, keep that to yourselves. Uh, and 
just recognize what the day is. Educate yourself on Black history because I don't think enough people know. So many people were discovering it this year. A Black Secret Serviceman had to tell Trump that today is Juneteenth because he was going to hold his rally in Tulsa today. And so there's a lot of ignorance. And I think this is the kind of day when people can address some of that ignorance. As a writer and as a public speaker, people often come to you for guidance, uh, for commentary, a lot of commentary right now <laughs> on the world that we're living in. How do you balance authority, confidence, and self-doubt, AKA insecurity, um, with all of this happening? Very carefully. You know, when people look to you to opine, they expect you to have all the answers and they expect you to always be wildly confident. And so I'm very good at projecting that level of confidence. And in many ways, I am confident about the things that I say because I put in the work and I do the research that is necessary to be able to have confident opinions. Uh, but I'm always racked by self-doubt and insecurity. And I'm always wondering if I've thought of everything that needs to be said, if I'm um, excluding people, uh, because I never want to be exclusionary. Uh, and so it's challenging, but I do it anyway. And I tell myself, no one's going to read it. And that really helps. Even though I know people are going to read it, it's really hard to maintain that delusion these days, but I still, I still work with it. Why are you so racked by insecurity? Um, I think I'm just human. And like many people, I deal with imposter syndrome and like, who am I to have an opinion? And who am I to speak to this cultural moment? Uh, why would anyone care about how I see the world? And so, you know, those doubts do tend to plague me and they're, they're frustrating. But I actually think it's kind of healthy to have some of those doubts because we see the kinds of thinkers who don't have any doubts and who are <laughs> wrong a lot of the time and who speak before they think and they speak before they listen. And so if that's the alternative, then I am fine with being insecure because my insecurity makes me work harder and it makes me ensure that I am being as accurate and factual and fair as possible. Despite the fact that we live together <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and we talk about these things all the time. I, I still felt um, I needed to do some due diligence. I went back to Bad Feminist. Mm -hmm. I was looking through it. I did some word search on certain words that I felt would be um, appropriate for this conversation. And I came across this quote. You write, I approach most things in life with a dangerous level of confidence to balance my generally low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you balance that? How do you navigate both? When do you know when the lead gene for one or the other should come out? You know, I don't know. I'm a Libra, so I'm always interested in balance, and I'm always trying to achieve it. Um, I think that the wild overcon it's not overconfidence, but the the wild confidence. I just you know, I look around and I see that the world has no shortage of opinions and so many of them are half-assed. And so it's a very low bar, but I'm just like, if that can exist in the world, then whatever I've got going on, there, there's no reason why it cannot also exist in the world. Uh, especially when I was younger, I would just say, you know, like, look at what white men are comfortable saying. Like, they'll say anything. And they will brand themselves experts. Like, a news story could break about asbestos right now and by three o'clock there would be some white man who'd be like well here's the history of asbestos because he fucking looked at wikipedia uh and so because the bar is so low i can just step right over it with uh my overconfidence and lack of self-esteem <laughs> so it just works out um and and you know roxanne isn't posturing this sort of low self-esteem persona um I don't think there's anything she's ever written um, wherein she tells me before it's published that it's the worst thing she's ever written or prior to writing something, she'll say, I don't think I can ever write again. I, I'm oh, thank finished. You. Please tell them everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
<laughs> but it's true. And and at first, you know, when she'd say that, I would be like, oh my God, you know, what? how do you respond to that? How do you comfort? How do you retort? How do you manage this in your partner? And now I'm just used to it. I'm like, you say this every time. You say this every <laughs> single time. And I then- do, But I also believe it and every she does. single time. Yes, she does. Um, how do you define imposter syndrome? I was talking about this this morning with someone because I have a really hard time. There's some bias already even in the term imposter syndrome. So, so how do you define it? Um, I, I think I define it fairly traditionally, like this feeling that you don't belong in the rooms and conversations that you are a part of uh, and that it's just going to take one moment and everyone's going to realize the jig is up. The emperor is not wearing any clothing. You are an imposter and they're going to get you out of that space. Um, and so that's how I define it. So there's a presumption though that you're in the space. Yes, absolutely. You are in the space and that, you know, young, young people, um, people of all ages really, but a lot of young women come up to me at my events and ask me how I deal with it. Or they ask from, you know, when I'm on stage and the reality is if you're already in the room, then you have done the work to get there and you should recognize that. And I always encourage them to sort of look back on their accomplishments. Oh my God, this is surreal. Um, With the background? Yeah, the background. Yeah. This is, yeah. This is Roxanne's library. We're actually in her office and I thought that her library is so beautiful. I wanted to make it our um, background, but apparently <laughs> I'm disappearing. She's disappearing. I'm getting notices that that I'm gone, and you know, it's just the superpower we have to mm. be able to flit in and out. <laughs> or she thought my office was too messy. <laughs> okay, let's be honest. Um, uh, Here's where I disappear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, were, what was the question? Um, imposter syndrome oh, yeah. and, so, and that sort of presumption that you know that the issue I have with imposter syndrome is that you have to believe that you're actually in the room to feel like an imposter being in the room. Oh my God, your New York accent just flew out. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, that's the thing that I always have to remind myself of and that I always encourage people who experience imposter syndrome to remind themselves of. You're, you're in the game, you're in the room, you're in the conversation already. It, it's never accidental, except for the president. And so, um, you have to remember that and you have to remind yourself of what it took to get to where you are. And uh, that can help, but it's also okay to live with that doubt. Uh, it's not necessarily unhealthy. It becomes unhealthy when that doubt keeps you from doing anything. Uh, and something I do notice quite a lot, and especially with women uh, and women writers in particular, is that they'll say, I just don't know if I'll have a chance. I know that the, the odds are already stacked against me and I don't know that I belong in publishing. And I'm just like, have you written a book? And nine times out of 10, they haven't even started a book. And it's like, <laughs> wow, slow down. Like, what are you worrying? So many people talk themselves out of achieving anything because they're so worried about the obstacles they're going to face. And the obstacles are indeed very real. But uh, it's so important to not talk yourself out of the things that you want to do professionally or personally. Um, talk about, I want to talk a little bit about likability. Mm -hmm. Um, you are, as I've described recently, Roxanne is feisty behind the keyboard, but very shy and very humble in person. That's true. And so why the disparity? Oh, I think online behind the keyboard. Well, first of all, I've been online since 1992 and, uh, back then it was like a 300 baud modem. And so, um, actually 1991, I would say. And so I grew up during the age when there were no images on the internet and it was all text-based. And so, and I'm a writer, so I found it really empowering to be online and I could pretend to be anyone I wanted. And everyone was pretending. It was a bunch of men pretending to be women talking to each other. It was hilarious. And I've sort of just carried that forward where when you have the remove of the computer screen, I, I find it a lot easier to think fast and to say exactly what I want to say. Uh, in person, I am actually really quiet. And 
um, shy. Really? Yeah. <laughs> this one is always trying to get me to talk and I'm like, I don't have anything to say uh, because I typed it all out. <laughs> and, but on the computer, I just, there, it's not that there are no consequences because it is the real world, but there are fewer barriers and it just, I think so fast with my fingers that I can be the best version of myself and the boldest version of myself and the take no shit is version of myself. And so I really enjoy that. And then in my real life, it's not that I don't, I don't take shit, but I do a little bit, <laughs> but this one doesn't. And <laughs> but so, we're opposites in that way. Cause yeah. online I try to be very polite, very nice. And in real life, you know, I'm, in real life, she's a beast. So, like, one day she was, <laughs> we split our time between here and New York, and one day she was standing on a street corner, and a man bumped into her, and she fucking shoved him into the street. I did not. He did shove I him. I think I pushed him, but I don't think I shoved him. And she's 5'4". It's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, she's really aggressive and scary. Roxanne doesn't even like to return things because she doesn't want to hurt somebody's feelings. She had to return something earlier today and she nearly cried. I was so proud of her that she actually did it. <laughs> and it was because I, I didn't want to upset them and the guys have worked so hard to carry them inside. And I was like, oh, we ordered the wrong table. And it just felt very bad, especially now when people, especially essential workers are... And, you know, putting themselves on the line so that, you know, we can get the end table we need. It just felt but very yet, bad. But yet on Twitter yesterday, you said to someone, go read a book, moron. No issue. No, pestilent moron. Pestilent <laughs> moron. I did. Pestilent moron. Yeah, I've, yeah. Never, I've never even written those words online. I know, online you're so kind and, and nice and in person. I mean, you're nice to me, <laughs> but like, she's a real ball buster. It's just amazing. Um, so likability, this is what you said mm -hmm. in Hunger about likability. You say, in many ways, likability is a very elaborate lie, a performance, a code of conduct dictating the proper way to be. Mm -hmm. So which is the proper you? Which is the real you? Uh, I, I think it's all the real me. Uh, I think it's just that there are versions of myself. The one thing that I've always prided myself on and people who meet me in people who eventually meet me in person who have only known me online say, oh my God, it's really you, you're the same. And I am, but it's just versions of myself. And especially online, in person, I'm deeply concerned with likability and I'm working on it with my therapist. But online, I don't care if you like me or not. I mean, I do because she sees me afterwards after I have a, an uncomfortable encounter on the internet or an angry encounter and I'm like deep in my feelings about it. And she's like, why do you care what these people think? Like Tom89734 is no one. And he's so, really no one. He's a bot. <laughs> yeah. And so I do try to balance that. But online, I just, you know, it's like, I don't care if you like me or not. I'm not here to be your friend. I have friends. And I'm also not here to be your mammy. And so I, when you're not as concerned with likability, I think you are not necessarily more honest, but more frank. Talk about what it means to be someone's mammy. We've been talking well, about that a lot. We have today. been talking about that a lot, uh, especially this week. You know, there is this expectation of Black women in particular that we are going to nurture you, nurture your feelings, and and give you the time and space um, to to be terrible. And I resist that, especially online, because I'm a grown woman and I I don't have any children, and there's only one person I have to take care of, uh, and th uh, that's. Debbie. Well, it's mutual. Yeah, it does like, go like that ways. last line in Pretty Woman, you know? You yes. Save each other right back. Absolutely. Um, so uh, you will see this quite a lot where people demand labor of Black women and where people have this expectation that, you know, they will, that you, that you have to cater to them and that you have to manage your tone to make them happy. So I'll give you an example real quick. I wrote a column a couple of weeks ago for um, I'm the new work friend for the New York Times and it's people write in for employment advice. And um, this woman asked, is it safe for her to employ her house cleaner? 
And it was actually, I understood the question. I think everyone is just trying to figure out the boundaries and so on. And I answered the question and I was being nice. <laughs> I was like, this is the, the, the thoughtful and polite version of me. <laughs> and I have gotten like literally, and I'm not exaggerating, 175 emails telling me, why did I castigate her? Why did I, you know, why did I like excoriate her? And, uh, and it's just interesting to see that when a black woman does not say things in the way you want, all of a sudden she's full of rage and anger. And I, it, it was not a castigation to tell someone why don't you worry about whether or not Maria, that was the housekeeper's name, is going to be safe. Like asking that question is not harsh. And if you perceive that as harsh, then I think you have some work to do on yourself. And so, you know, I just, I'm not your mammy. That's not me. Um, you have said that you find likable characters actually rather boring. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say right now to people that are trying to do the right thing or be more likable um, in regards to Black Lives Matter? We're seeing a lot of performative wokeness. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of um, group behavior that feels very much um, pressured. Mm -hmm. Um, talk about how people are engaging with each other around Black Lives Matter and and just your sense of what's happening right now. Well, as always, I think when people recognize the extent of a problem, they overcorrect. Now, it is not an overcorrection to acknowledge Black Lives Matter, uh, but the way that corporations, and I have an essay coming out in the Times about this tomorrow, the way the corporations have fallen in line with these elaborate statements when they have no black executives and no black board members, you know, that's the frustration. There's this huge disconnect between people saying black lives matter and putting a little black square on Instagram or you know, these corporate statements. And now corporations, of course, are throwing money at the problem but a one-time donation of $100,000 is really a good gesture, but so many of these problems are systemic and systemic problems require uh, sustainable like endowment level funding. And it has to be something that will be in place not only today, but 10 years from now and 100 years from now. And so it's a little strange to see some of these gestures being made and seeing the way that they're being celebrated when they are a step in the right direction, but it's a very small step when you look at the scope and extent of the problem and the inequities that we are trying to address. So what are we doing about voter enfranchisement? And what are we doing about making sure that everyone who wants to vote this November can vote without putting their lives at risk. And that's going to be a significant problem. And it's going to be a significant problem, especially for black people. And so I, I really want people to take this energy and know that the fight does not end next week when something else happens and you move on. And we're already seeing some of this white fatigue and this ally fatigue where white people are just exhausted from having had to think about racism for literally two weeks. Uh, and that's a real issue. And when you see that, I, I encourage all of you to call your friends and yourselves out on that, because if you're exhausted, imagine how black people feel. Right. I mean, I, I, as somebody who's worked in the discipline of branding for a very long time, about 15 years ago or so, we started to see companies that wanted to jump on the sustainability brand, uh, bandwagon, brandwagon. <laughs> um, they, we started to see um, them pretend to be doing sustainable things. And we came up with the term, but not, not me, uh, just the, the sort of discipline of greenwashing. Mm -hmm. and, and that was used to out any company that was really not, behaving sustainably, even if they were talking sustainably. And we've seen how the month of pride, how, how June has become this sort of rainbow emblazing moment for corporations. And I can't help but say, you know, where were you 10 years ago? Where were you during the AIDS crisis? Um, and not to say that their efforts are insincere, but I think we have to balance the um, exuberance in which they're now proclaiming um, being um, 
supportive. And, and I feel like we're in another moment of that where it feels like there's, again, this performative wokeness that somehow has to be uh, shared to be credible. Yeah. Um, and so, so for people that are feeling insecure about what to do mm -hmm. in this moment, what is one thing that the white community can do for the black community so that we're one community? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> and I don't want to make you have to work because I'm no. making, doing the very thing you asked us not <laughs> no, to do. No, I understand where the question comes from. Um, you know, I think that's a good question and I don't have a good answer yet because it can't just be vote because voting is not enough. Um, but I do think it, it does involve getting active in our communities and the ways that we're seeing these protests continue. Like it cannot end. And if you don't want to go out and protest yourself, that's understandable, but support the protesters, support bail funds. Uh, I do think that money goes a long way in, with regard to many of these issues, um, but not everyone has the resources to give money. So if not give your time, volunteer for organizations that are serving marginalized communities. Um, it just, sometimes you just have to think small. Like one person is not going to fix systemic racism and one donation to the NAACP or buying two books from a black author. All of these gestures are great, but it's not gonna fix the no, problem. There, and there isn't just one thing. There no. is by no means just one thing, but for people that want to do something. Yeah, just, I is, think just pick something, literally anything. Just make sure that you're doing something that you're not just like, and it has to be more than symbolic. Like that Instagram thing was, mm -mm. it cannot be like blacking out an Instagram. Like that's not changing literally anything. But first of all, not everyone's on Instagram. And so you want to just pick something that you can do in your community that you think is going to contribute to the betterment of the black community and or starting to erode racism in a small way. Like, do you have, I think we have to think small before we think big.